So anyone that has studied poker strategy over the last few years has always heard that you should think in ranges. Well, that's easy to say, but a lot of people have no clue or it isn't explained to them well, how exactly do you think in ranges? How do you construct ranges? Well, every time you face a decision in poker, you have a range. Your opponents also have ranges. But what you primarily need to learn first is how to construct your own poker range. So every time you have a range, you also have a way that you play each part of that range. And when you balance each part of, part of that range, you need to have some overlap between your ranges. So you need to play certain hands a certain way, and you need to have weak hands that you play the same way. You know, strong hands play the same as some weak, some middle strength hands played like some strong hands on down the line. And so, but first, the first step is to categorize those ranges. And the way I like to think about it, this is something I learned, I don't know, back in 2007 or eight. Uh, the basic idea of it was found on the Flop Turn River poker forum. And I believe the gentleman's name was Renton. That was his, his screen name, R-E-N-T-O-N, I believe. And I believe I mentioned him in my book before, but this is what gave me the idea of constructing the way I construct my ranges. Now, the basic idea is you have tiers of your range. So you have a tier one, tier two, maybe tier three, and a tier four range. So every time you have a hand range that you're gonna play certain ways, you can categorize it by tiers. So tier one might be your nut range. Like a hand that no matter what, you're never folding that range, and you're trying to get all in the best way you can with that range. And then your tier two range might be your value range or your strong draws. Hands that you have a lot of equity, but you don't necessarily always want to just immediately try to get the money in with. Sometimes you do, but a lot of the time you're just trying to get two streets of value with it. You're trying to make your draw enough time to make it profitable, that type of thing. So it's strong equity hands that aren't nut hands would maybe be tier two. Tier three would be the hands just below that. Now, sometimes there's gray area between these tiers, but tier three would be like your showdown value hands. Think third pair, second pair, ace highs, you know, maybe weak draws, hands that you want to realize equity with sometimes, hands you want to get to showdown with a lot of the time because sometimes you can win a showdown with a showdown value hand, right? So that would be your tier three hands. Tier four is usually thought of as something like air. Now there's some air that's better than other airs, like maybe you have backdoor draws, you know, that type of thing. So that would be like the gray area between tier three and tier four. So tier one is max equity hands, tier two is good equity hands, tier three is pretty good equity hands, showdown value, tier four is very low equity hands, not as much value. So you wanna have hands from each tier that you play similarly to all the other tiers. And that's how we balance out. So whenever you have a nut hand, so let's say you played all your tier one hands the same way. You just bet 80% pot or potted it every single time with tier one. And then when you had maybe top pair, top kicker, a tier two hand, you bet 60% pot and you always fold to do a raise. Well, let's say you had a tier, your tier three hand, your showdown value, you always check call or you check back. Or when you have a tier four hand, Sometimes you fire one bluff and then you give up. Maybe you bluff half pot. So you're betting 80% with tier one, you're betting 60% with tier two, you're not betting at all with tier three, and you're betting half pot with tier four. It's not gonna take long for a good player to figure out what you're doing there, right? And this is the way a lot of players play. Now, there is a fundamental reason to bet big with big hands and bet small with small hands. We need to be doing that, but there needs to be an envelope you need to have situations where you're doing the opposite. Now, how do you mix it up here? I'm not saying you shouldn't take a betting strategy similar to the one I just said, but you need to also have doubt in your opponent's minds on whether you happen to be bluffing or having a, a, a value hand this time. And you have to find that right balance or ratio. Usually you want something like, what, two thirds value, one third bluff. And when you have that kind of ratio, it makes it very, very, difficult to play with and not necessarily GTO optimal, but think about it. What's that old saying? I mean, that saying's been around for 50 years. You know, if you're going to bluff, sometimes you actually have to be holding the cards. And this is exactly what we're talking about. It actually works in modern poker. So the way we balance it is, and the way I tell people to balance it is in a very simple way. And that's by using other factors that we have in play for us. So if we have a strong nut hand, 
Maybe we, it isn't vulnerable. Maybe there aren't that many draws out there. Maybe we decide to play that more like a tier two if it's um, a high vulnerable hand. So maybe we play it like a tier two if it's just a moderate vulnerability hand, like there's a few draws, but not that many. If there's no draws whatsoever, then maybe we play that like a tier three hand. And sometimes we either bet small or check that back. Same thing with a tier two hand. We can use the same kind of scenario. Maybe this time we don't use vulnerability. Maybe we use something like backdoor draws to make our choice. So the times we do have a backdoor flush draw, we decide to play it like a tier four or a tier one. It doesn't really matter. As long as you're reasonable with it and you're playing all of your tiers like another tier at some point or another, you're gonna just be inherently balanced. That's, this is something you can work on for years to perfect. I'm just trying to make you aware of it if you happen to not be aware of this entire process. First step is to be able to instantly categorize your range into groupings or tiers. Get that right first, then we can worry about balancing down the road. So anytime you're, and let's say, let's just give the most common example. You've open raised, you've been called, and now you have a C-bet situation. You need to know exactly what hands you're willing to stack off with, you need to know what part of your range you just want to get to showdown value with, and you need to know which part of your range is good to bluff with. Maybe the hands have backdoor equity, maybe the hands you'll pick up more equity on the turn a lot, and which hands you should just completely give up with most of the time. So once you have that down, then we can start thinking about balancing. But the first step is learning how to construct your poker range, and the way I recommend doing that is to break your hands into tiers and then start practicing. Now, how do you figure out which hands you should be stacking with and not stacking? Well, I recommend a book called Professional No Limit Hold'em. This is another old book, but it teaches you about a concept called stack to pot ratio or SPR. And if you haven't read this book, it's, it's a must read for any aspiring poker player or serious poker player. And while some of the concepts might be a slightly outdated, you know, I would say a good majority of the book as far as is kind of timeless. Like commitment is commitment even today although thresholds may vary based on the thresholds of, or of the opponents you happen to be playing. People are thinking this way more nowadays, so the thresholds might be a little bit lower than they used to be, so your standard... Anyways, I don't want to get too far in the weeds with this. You'll understand what I'm talking about once you read this book or get into this book, but definitely check that out. Highly recommended. So if you have any questions or comments, I'd love to hear them below. What do you think about putting your... Are you currently putting your hands into tears? And if not, how do you construct your ranges? Or, or how are you figuring out what, are, what is a strong hand and what is a weak hand? What is the relative strength of your hand? That kind of thing. And I actually do give away a free strategy um, that breaks, that kind of shows you how to, in a basic way, how to break down your hand tiers. For let's say you're playing a short stack in cash games. That's what the, the, the guide or free guide that I give away. All you gotta do is click the link in the description. I'll put it here above as well if possible. Even if you just read it for the hand tier part, um, you might find some benefit from it. So thanks for watching and good luck at the tables.